Assalamu alaikum, respected physicians, welcome you all in today's lecture session. Today, our 84th lecture session organized by ECG study group under the ECG basic and beyond. So today, our speaker is Professor Jodri Hafizul Hassan Sir, and his topic is case-based studies. Before start of the lecture session, I'd like to request Professor Rafi Kamath Sir to uh, speak some words <laughs> regarding Chaudhary Hafiz Hassan Sir, and then we proceed on the next lecture. Rafi Kamath Sir. Assalamu alaikum and good evening and good morning in stage. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Hafiz. Um, Hafiz is a professor of medicine um, and a program director of cardiology fellowship training program at uh, University of Nevada, Hard Vascular. He's well known to all of us. Uh, he's also the president of uh, uh, American College of Cardiology, Nevada chapter. Um, so, I mean, uh, you all know him. Uh, I don't need to introduce him. So, Hafiz, please proceed. So, thank you, Ravik Bhai, and uh, thank you all for uh, coming to this session. And um, we'll do some didactic case discussion. Um, this is about um, one of the patients that we had few weeks ago, 58 year old with uh, um, quite a few comorbidities. And as you can see, CKD, hypertension, CVA, hypothyroidism, and then cardiology was called in for pre-op before the cholecystectomy. And this was the EKG. So this was uh, the EKG from the ER. So you can see there is uh, sinus rhythm and there is QRS widened and there is right bundle morphology. But then when she was in the hospital, the uh, emergency response team was called in because blood pressure went up, heart rate went down, and this was the rhythm recorded. Any comment? So you can start from the top panel and go down and make a comment, see any observation. Was there any history of the vertigo loss of syncope like this? No, like no dizziness, is... no. But during the time of Mar, she felt dizzy, but not before. Even shortness of breath? No, no shortness of breath. So uh, looks like uh, if you look at the, the lowest panel, the heart rate really drops. W what do you think, uh, Atharvai? Yes, the patient has got the, the previous CC shows the RBB with the first degree heart block. That is the... Can you show the first disease again, please? Yeah. PR was 322. So there is clearly first degree AV block and the right bundle, right? What about the axis? Yes, right axis. So um, I'm sure many of you do not like this term, trifascicular block, but block means delay, not block. In, in, uh, so uh, it is by right bundle, right left posterior hemi block, and first degree hemi block. So this is not a good setup. And then she went into this. So in the middle of the night, with this problem, blood pressure systolic is good. So does the patient need a pacemaker? My question is, does the patient need a temporary wear? And then, then question is permanent. What do you do now? So, so when there is a body, when there is a mechanism like this, we ask the question about. So um, as Atarbai pointed out, whether there was any symptom, but this is too low, 
when there is a question about AV nodal or infranodal block, we try to understand that whether this is infranodal, which is unreliable, or if it is AV nodal, can we counteract with medicine? Because vagal will worsen, beta blocker will worsen. Afis, can you go back to the ECG, please? Yeah. The bradycardia. So yeah. what time was it? In the middle of the night. In the middle of the night. Okay, and the patient was lying sleeping happily, right? Not sleeping. Patient is awake. Which is because, of the, because, because of the gallbladder, patient was having some pain in the belly. Okay. And that, and that, that might activate vagal tone. Mm -hmm. no, yeah. no, 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 no. Just let's think a little simple. Mm -hmm. So this is in the middle of the night. Patient did not pass out or did not get dizzy, right? Right. Okay, fine. So I mean, just if we think just simple, one possibility is vagal. But if it were vagal, we expect the blood pressure to drop a little bit also. Right. It did not, but you, you can have isolated um, cardio inhibitory. Mm -hmm. But this is, if you look at the top strip, there are four QRS complexes, P followed by QP. There is no block, except, except what you described before. And then right. there is a pause, which one possibility you can just call, well, this is simple Sanders syndrome. Or if you are imaginative, you can call a non-conducted premature bit. Uh, that will require a lot of imagination because I can't see the P wave. I cannot see the, any distortion of the T wave. So that's the other possibility. Um, so the nurses were more panicky than the patient herself, right? Correct. Yes. The good thing yes. is that the blood pressure is 190. Yes. Okay. And the patient sure. is not synchronizing. Sure. Okay. So I just wanted to bring up this issue about, you know, the concerning thing, uh, whether this is a infranodal or um, or it is a nodal block. So sometimes it is the company you keep, the right bundle and the post left posterior hemiblock. There is significant conduction system disease, and in the face of that, this bradycardia we gave the pacemaker, and after the pacemaker, this is the um, rhythm, the sinus, and then paste. So does it help you to understand this was infranodal or nodal? So Hafiz, patient got the pacemaker based on that indication? Is it based temporary pacemaker or permanent? Oh, it's permanent pacemaker. Permanent, permanent pacemaker. pacemaker. Uh, yeah. Based on a nighttime bradycardia without history of syncope. And, and, but no, not sleep, not during sleep. No, it doesn't matter, but at night, and there is no EP study done to prove conduction problem, right? Well, I'm coming to that, Pratik Bhai. Okay, sure. All right. I'm coming to that. Uh, I'm coming to that. Echo is okay. Okay. And the another thing that is also in the play or was in the play is that the patient is pre-op and uh, was going to gallbladder surgery. Uh, so um, there is controversies. That's why I'm going to bring you this, uh, this case. Um, so, so it looks like sinus and then V paste, right? Yes. Mm. So will that, will that uh, help us to make any comment that whether it was nodal or infranodal? Uh, in this patient? Yeah. Well, there is, I mean, there is definitely infranodal conduction problem because you cannot tell it by the PR interval. But if you take broad, there is a right bundle, there is left posterior fascicular block. So definitely there is infranodal conduction problem. But it was not causing any high-grade AV block. The PR itself, sometimes by the PR interval, you cannot tell why there is infranodal or nodal. A lot of times, if there is a PR is prolonged, it's more nodal than infranodal. Um, and the perfect example is a lot of patients with left bundle who has syncope with normal PR interval. When we do intracardiac conduction intervals, you find prolonged HV interval in the setting of a normal PR interval. So can I add something? Yeah. Sometimes we get patients who have trifascular block, but no obvious history of syncope or other things. But uh, 
they are not feeling well. And if we do the antipropion P, we find that the patient have raised antipropion P more than 1,000, quite significant, but there is no other obvious uh, cause. Could that be related to uh, the severe bradycardia at sleep time? And will that patient need pacing for that reason? The patient actually is having a bit of heart failure. No, I mean, we don't, we don't put pacemakers in. Triphysical about that, we have many patients. We follow them. If they have syncope, they, you can consider, but then you, you also have to be careful if there is a 55-year-old with syncope with triphysical blood versus an 85-year-old. Um, I have more higher threshold of putting pacemaker in 55-year-old. Um, if it is pre-syncope, you have to be careful again whether the symptom and um, bradycardia is related or not. The whole point is a lot of this patient may end up needing pacemaker in future, but if I can delay it by five years or 10 years, I'm prolonging the longevity of the um, battery life. Uh, and the probian- Excellent the point, can, Rupai. Yeah. We were doing some, in those patients, um, what is your observation? I would definitely do an echo, make sure there is no aortic stenosis. These are old patients and no diastolic dysfunction. Exactly. Because we did them walking, to see two reasons. One is that the uh, conduction system gets better or not, meaning heart rate. And then importantly, we did exercise related, post-exercise six minutes walk and a BNP and see whether the BNP goes higher because uh, it was part of our diastolic dysfunction um, research. And many of them actually show a, a very significant increase in BNP from baseline when they do uh, six minutes or 10 minutes walking. So which I it I, tells I, me that small dose of diuretics may help them at least symptomatically. I think I agree with that point because the reason is pro-BNP, we expect some, some sort of feeling pressure up, uh, you know, bottom line. So uh, there's different way to measure the feeling pressure uh, and, and at rest and stress uh, as, as uh, you know, Definitely direct way to do right heart cat and figure it out. Uh, There's one way or when you do the heart cat, you can figure it out. But if, if there is a feeling pressure going up, that can explain the pro BMP to go up for any reason, not much bradycardia right. itself. Uh, right. Second question uh, is, uh, yes, exercise induced pro BMP rise. That's a quick way out, you know, very easy way to do it in, in, instead of going inside the right heart catheterization because diastolic, Dysfunction is a major problem with that. And yeah. you can also look at another point, whether there's a dyssynchrony, dyssynchrony in the ventricle. When you look at the echocardiogram, if you see how the apex is moving, how the lateral walls coming in with the same time or not, or there's a dyssynchrony, that can cause some problem with the heart failure. That can also raise pro BNP level, but that's a different level. But echocardiogram would be the right thing to do first approach. And the dyssynchrony on this situation alone in the yeah. diastolic dysfunction, you know, to propose a by V paste is not going to be an easy sell to the EP guys. That the is true. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and, and Rovik Bhai rightfully pointed out that. So, um, so this is the conduction system. And then, you know, we talk about this uh, infranodal just for the audience. Um, that, that we look at the AH and HV in this, in our patient, the HV was uh, more than uh, 55. Um, it was about 100. And therefore they decided to, um, to put the pacemaker. And also we took into consideration that the anesthesia will give uh, hard time in terms of uh, trifascicular block and going into surgery. But that is a small point because sometimes you can hold their hand and say, you will be fine. Keep atropine at, at bedside and also pacer pad and you can fly through the surgery. But the main reason was that the HV, we proved that it was longer. The normal HV is 35 to 55. So next case. I think another, point, yeah. another point on that particular patient, prior patient, was there any role to give some dose of atropine to see what is getting worse, the conduction? Well, uh, well, uh, I showed you Alice, by that what yeah, we yeah. can do to manipulate. In this mm -hmm. case, they gave atropine 
and also they tried dopamine. None of them did anything. Okay. Yeah. So, Hafiz Bhai. Yeah. Achha, uh, again, the regarding the your first case, that is without EP study, the indication was class two B, but after EP study, it became class one. Um, it definitely became class one or class two A. I don't know exactly. It is one or two A. I leave okay. it. Bhai, it is a class one for. HV no, more than 55. Okay, what was what was the HV? 100. Yeah. Well, this is this is the way it is. If somebody's HV interval is a properly done HV interval is over 100, you can put a pacemaker in because they these are patients are going to be the highest risk. Mm -hmm. If it is between 70 and 100, then you depend on the symptom. So if somebody comes with syncope, HV interval of 75, I would put a pacemaker in. Left bundle yeah. branch block, syncope 70, but over 100, it's basically, a, a, it's an accepted indication for permanent pacemaker. Actually, syncope is a blessing because in that case, you probably would not even do uh, HV interval. You just put okay. a pacemaker. Exactly, <laughs> triphysical block with syncope. Yeah. Um, uh, depend, uh, you also have to look at the clinical scenario, but most yeah. likely it, it is intermittent mm -hmm. AV block. Yeah. So um, this is a 66-year-old uh, with uh, stage 4 pancreatic cancer. Um, and this is actually a very important issue to me that every time we see ECG, I think the way we are grown up, like uh, in our medical school everywhere, we read ECG like a tracing. ECG is not a tracing. ECG has to be read in the context of clinical presentation. And I'll tell you how we learn from this case. Clinical context, clinical context, clinical context. And it's very important because ECG means that we'll be doing a series of actions and the actions have implications. So this patient had this EKG with chest pain. Anyone? So if you look at the lower panel, because lead two, I, I go to lead two, it's very good to know whether there is any uh, rhythm issue. Looks like, looks like sinus stack, probably safe to say sinus stack. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, there is a right bundle and anything else. Look at the axis. Yeah, left uh, left yes, anterior. Left anterior block there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but in the past, we used to do right bundle and, you know, ISIS one, two, they included right bundle. Then they took it off because right bundle is still, you can have ST elevation. So right bundle alone is not good enough for calling a STEMI because um, left bundle, we, go, we invoke garbosa. So here, do you think there is right bundle and anterior ST elevation? Certainly the B4, B5 raised the question and the chest pain was really convincing. So what do you do? Next best step in his management. Is it new onset RBB or known RBB? Uh, new onset RBB. Again, okay, so new, new onset RBB is all. But the clinical context is very important, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll go for C. So, Ravik Bhai, do you want to poll or just we just move forward? No, I think this is a question of opinion. I mean, this is a, this, uh, first of all, patient with chest pain, right? Yeah. And and have stage four um, pancreatic cancer. Yeah. So the, the, that part is, is is important. But I mean, from my blind sense, if the how old is the patient? 66. I'll probably do an yeah. angiogram, see what's going on. Yeah. So that's uh, that's what we did. But we also did echo on the way. But we, we, we saw this, you know, sometimes uh, in the COVID time, we see like 
typical Takasubu with the inflammatory search or stress search, like emotional stress, sympathetic pathway, inflammatory pathway, and rarely serotonin pathway, typical classic Takasubu. But here, it is more of a regional wall motion, and LAD was occluded, which is not a surprise, correct? That the new right bundle, 10 out of 10 chest pain, and the ST segment in P5, V6 elevated with the right bundle. So um, the patient had the revascularization done, and then patient was doing good, uh, and then getting lightheaded and palpitation. And this repeat EKG, and then followed by that, this EKG. Anybody, any comment on this ECG? Yeah, there's more A waves than V waves, and, and the PR interval is not very consistent. So there's some concern about the association going on. Yeah, I mean, I have some comment, Hafiz, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, sure. Interesting ECG because previous ECG showed right bundle band blocked, left enterophysical block. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is complete hard block mm -hmm. with left bundle pattern escape rhythm. So this brings us to the concept. You know, we used to say complete left bundle bunch block, complete right bundle bunch block. Actually, that theory is now gone. Yeah. So this patient, even though had right bundle bunch block, now the conduction is through the right bundle, producing a pattern of left bundle bunch pattern. I mean, this is of theoretical interest and curiosity that in a patient with complete left right bundle bunch block, how can you have a junctional escape? The reason I'm saying it's a junctional escape, if you look at the initial R wave in V1 and V2, it's narrow. And if you look at V6 and lead one, looks almost like typical left bundle bunch block pattern. So uh, th this is interesting. The other very, part- Very, very the good other point. Part, yeah, the other part is that we're talking about new right bundle, new left, I don't think it really matters because in case of left bundle, new matters. I'm not sure how we, unless you have something else to say that new right bundle, does it matter? Because even if you block the LED, right bundle is on the right side and it should not affect it. Yeah, and this is a very good point. So even if it is a new, the new right bundle to the patient or new right bundle um, to the physician, that is another important thing. In the absence of previous EKG, the, it is expected that even if it is the proximal LAD before the first septal perforator, the occluded, the right bundle with that, you still should be able to see the ST elevation. So um, the criteria for right bundle and STEMI activation still remains with the ST elevation. But left bundle is problematic, as you know, that we need to do the Garbosa criteria. So we wanted to show you this because AV dissociation, when we talk about, we need to understand what is the atrial mechanism of depolarization and what is the uh, ventricular mechanism of depolarization and what is the relationship between AV. In ventricular tachycardia, you can have AV dissociation, but the ventricular rate will be faster. So in this case, what is the next best step now at this point? The 24 hours later, patient going this, and what do you do now? While we are thinking, the patient does this. <laughs> <laughs> So they, this is actually a real, real thing because they are thinking about pacemaker or not. And then the nurse called the fellow back. What, said, what, what is the magnesium this. level? Okay, magnesium level was done later, but mm -hmm. magnesium was given. Um, okay. And so level is not going to matter much. 
because it was uh, magnesium was given. I think they gave two gram of magnesium. But because you asked this question, will you call it a polymorphic VT or will you call it a monomorphic VT? The reason I'm saying VT, because we see narrow complex in the middle of white complex storm. Um, so I think it is probably obvious that this is VT. Ravik, by any comment? So uh, this makes the case very difficult. Please don't forget this patient has stage four pancreatic cancer. So now you stent to develop complete heart block. And the, the first few beats, some narrowing, this is just initiation of the VT. Um, and then probably there is fusion bit or whatever it is, but it is sustained monomorphic VT. Sustained monomorphic VT is unlikely to be related to electrolytes or acute ischemia. Uh, that patient has scar. It's a no question, it's just the substrate. Um, but the issue would be- Huh. I just wanted to give you a compliment. The moment you said, and this is very important, that's why every time I see a patient like this, I think the Bangladesh perspective as well. Everybody, please note that what Ravik Bhai said, this patient has pancreatic cancer stage four, and we are doing all these. There should be a you know, frank, open discussion with the family with empathy, because it is, it is tough, uh, and we are all our physicians, but we also need to be pragmatic. Um, so we did do the uh, cath again, and I said that this is monomorphic VT, um, but I was not on call. My, my ex-fellow now attending said, that, no, 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 we need to have a look. I said, oh, go ahead and look. So they did look, and I said, I was sure that the stent is patent. And I don't blame him because it was his patient. He was emotional about his stent. Stent was patent. And that, uh, and question is, they obviously put a temporary pacer. Question is, what do you do next? What do you put it? Will you put a device in this patient? Because of the monomorphic VT sustained little over 24 hours later, most likely scar related. Um, VT. Now what? The rub is right. When you yeah. as, per, as per guideline, if the patient's uh, prognosis is that is a survival is expected more than one year, then he needs it. So it's I would good. ask the audience to look for this. Actually, it says word for word what Atharvai just said in the guidelines. So please consult and don't jump. And do not offer ICD without talking to the expert. And this is the guidelines. We did not give ICD to that patient because the prognosis is can I, really- can I, can, I, can I make a comment? Yeah. Okay, first of all, this patient has heart block. I mean, the a stage four can, pancreatic, if I had stage four pancreatic cancer, I would rather die of VT and VF then pain of pancreatic cancer. So that will be my personal choice, short of committing suicide. <laughs> Number two, if you think that there is degree of prognosis, you can always put a live waste on this patient and give them toxic dose of amiodarone if needed. Keep it under control. I am yet to see a pancreatic, I mean, I have a couple of patients with pancreatic cancer surviving up to two years, but that's very rare, Hafiz, right? I mean, it is extremely yeah. rare that you see a pancreatic cancer survive beyond one year. So definitely not a defibrillator. If so Rubik, but I did not bring up this issue about wearable uh, ICD, like a life vest, because A, our audience, you know, we are all are from Bangladesh, and this is a secondary prophylaxis. And therefore yes. we were a little not so keen to offer uh, life vest, but we discussed among ourselves and actually, when we went to the patient, uh, pancreatic cancer patients may have a higher incidence of depression. Wadud is very good in internal medicine. Remind me if that is true. And, 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 and the second thing is that patient knowingly wanted nothing to be done after knowing Perfect. all this. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Actually, so, in, um, in, in our country, it's very obvious. We really, when you get this into these situations, we always pay attention 
যে জিম যদি স্যার যেটা বলতেন বাবা রুগি তো মারা যাবে তার ফ্যামিলি কে মেরে ফেলো না রাইট ফাইনান্স right so i just recapitulate ourselves about the sa node sa node has a you know 60 40 uh, for the exam purposes 60 40 vascular distribution 60 40 and then uh, the av node is 90 10 but pay attention to the uh, right bundle because that has a dual blood supply um, so it is important to pay attention to this compared to the you know left anterior fascicular block the uh, the anterior fascicle is mainly from the lad but it, it, this is the ekg exam test and as rovik bhai pointed out the board really wants you to understand that you understand that atrial mechanism ventricular mechanism and atrioventricular relationship and then morphology of the sts and what you can deduce from that. And uniquely, there is a column for pacemaker, which Rafik Bhai has addressed many times, that how you diagnose pacemaker function, that is another category. One of the things that in the board exam, they really ask you heavily is whether there is any specific diagnosis you can come up with, like hyperkalemia, hypercalcemia, brugada, and the and the point distribution is more for the clinical disorder because you can get the EKG right, but if you fail to diagnose the clinical disorder, you may not get score enough. 76 year old cabbage, and then, um, then this EKG, and then this is a ventricular paste. Um, and, and I just wanted to um, mention this, the, in the EKG report, sometimes they say when they interrogate the ERI and then EOS. Uh, but I don't know that our audience is clear with this, that elective replacement interval versus the end of service. Ravik, do you have any comment? Because sometimes people panic. The ERI, they think, oh, pacemaker is gone. And then they admit the patient and and uh, prolonged hospitalization, which you can do as an outpatient. Rafik Bhai, unmute. When a pacemaker reaches elective replacement, you still have at least three months left battery, right. full function battery. Even after that, that is life left in the pacemaker. So, so a pacemaker reaching ERI doesn't mean that patient has to be admitted to the hospital. Right. Um, so that was a comment, but before I bombard you with this one, this is ugly. So this is ugly, but let me give you the history. 38 year old male with history of little bit of drug abuse. Um, and then come with this comment. Uh, I can see the ECG. Oh uh, yeah. Can you see this? Yeah. It is ugly, is it? <laughs> yeah. So the question is, um, for the audience, I would say, please do not get intimidated with the EKG ever. Because you can say, this is white complex tacky, then it broke and it shows sinus and then another white complex, then sinus, another white complex. Question is, what is it? We can give a differential, white complex tachycardia. This is really white. Any comment? We did an echocardiogram, echo was normal. Normal LV function. Normal RV function, normal RV size. Yes, Avish Bhai, in the sinus bit, sir, there is, uh, possibly there is pre-excitation in the sinus bit, sir, on the right side. I mean, if you look at it in rhythm step below, you can see some slurring of lead two. And of course, V1, V2, V3, but the PR is not very short. So- and, But when I mapped, 
I, I told the residents, not the fellows. I told the if fellows do not measure the RR. They want to guess. And I tell them, fellows, it is tediously, you know, it is it is important to measure the RR tediously. There is irregularly irregular RR. And this irregularity, this much, unlikely to be VT. So this was the, uh, I wanted to show you the baseline EKG. Uh, okay, so they, they did not give me the baseline, but it is a pre-excitation on the baseline. Let me. But you know, can you go back to the first is actually what Arthur pointed out is if you look at- Yeah, so I'm so sorry that uh, the, as Arthur Bhai pointed out, the uh, there is a, a delta wave in the sinus node. And uh, this is actually a WPW. So when we scanned, we did not scan the uh, the baseline EKG, um, but it is irregularly irregular if you look at carefully. So one of the things that happens with the antidromic tachycardia with WPW, that the AFE is really faster than usually you see. It is about 190, 200 to 10. With this degree of fast ventricular rate with uh, irregular, uh, it is, you always look for in a young patient, it is actually uh, very suggestive of um, WPW underlying. And in this case, it is documented in the same setting that there is a pre-excitation. One of our EP physician still does not think that this is WPW alone. He accepts WPW but he thinks there is a VT as well, Rafik Bhai. Yeah, well, it's a little bit puzzling. I'll tell you why. If yeah. we look at lead V1, the first bit is not, can you go back please? Yeah. Yeah. No, the ECG, I can't see the ECG. This is the ECG. No, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just stay there a little bit. It takes time to come up. <laughs> Okay, if we look at lead V1, first QRS is relatively narrow, and then there is early transition. If it is true lead position, that's suspicious. But the wide QRS in V1, there is a negative possible delta wave, but the next one doesn't have. And then in V2, the initial R wave is narrow. So that's why your EP physician said, Maybe not, because yeah. if we look at lead V6, if it were pre-excited bit, initial slurring would be more, which it is not. So that is my problem, <laughs> along with so, your EP physician. Right, but the EP physician was involved in the case, ablated the accessory pathway, and we yeah. compromised. We are sending for and cardiac MR, Rafik Bhai, is it too much? Yeah. No, no, I'll do that. But the problem okay. is the guy is a drug addict and he's <laughs> methamphetamine. No, no, that's not the, nothing against him, but methamphetamine is a stimulant. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. And that's the problem. Yeah. So, um, you know, you can go through the algorithm about uh, how you diagnose the uh, WPW, left-sided pathway, right-sided pathway, V1, uh, Delta wave positive is left sided, and then two three AVA positive, then interceptor. I'm not going into details, but uh, um, I can share the slide deck if you want. Um, but the bottom line is that we need to really verify uh, the patients with WPW asymptomatic, and uh, WPW is one thing, but it's symptomatic with antidromic tachycardia and higher risk for sudden cardiac death which is pretty low, but it's still about 0.1, 0.2% per year. But when there is this degree of antidromic tachycardia white, white complex, there is of course you worry about sudden cardiac death and you need to make sure that 
the patient gets the right therapy, which is ablation. So 64 year old uh, with uh, heart, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and then this EKG, what do you think the diagnosis is? So again, this is white complex tachycardia. We don't see the P wave and the RR interval is pretty irregular. Actually, irregularly irregular. Left bundle morphology. The VT does not usually follow a typical bundle morphology and the axis is usually Northwest. So in this case, it is a with left bundle. So, uh, FE with left bundle, and then EF is bad. How we control this FE rate? Because they feel lousy when they go into FE with fast ventricular rate, particularly with this degree of left bundle and this synchrony. Any, any suggestion? Yeah, this FE is paroxysmal or persistent? Well, this has happened uh, following the recent cabbage. And what he has been on right now? Any medications? Are uh, this this is the first time discovered? If it, yeah. But the patient has a lip bundle from before, so it was not a problem. You can compare. So the rate went up, and then. Sinus became now a fit. So, what medications to give to control the rate? What is the ejection factor? 20%. And, and it is post op uh, or just for, for a while bypass? A few days out. Okay. Routinely, they will try amiodarone. That's the way they do it. Yeah, so that's what we gave, and, uh, and also gave Lasix. Can, can you go back? Stop, cabbage. Can you go back, please? It, can you see it now? Yes. So what are the working diagnosis? FE with lip bundle. Yes, yes, because it is irregular. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. The other part is that if you look at the initial R wave, there is a tiny R in lead V2. And the initial deflection is very sharp. So the, both of those points towards left bundle. Yeah. And then uh, this is the patient with cabbage, stroke, and then lightheadedness, and this EKG. I think we're still on the whole EKG. Can you see? Yeah. So we had uh, concern from the um, hospitalist that, wow, look at the P wave. Ischemia causing this bradycardia or it is just bradycardia for some reason. So how you handle this? Electricity and plumbing both or plumbing first, then electricity, how, how you handle? So, the, uh, the ECT changes are uh, consequent to the Vandenberg block pattern. So, it, depending upon the patient's symptom, I will decide whether the uh, it is chemical origin or the conduction system is the more important. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hafi, the question is, is the ischemia causing this conduction problem? Correct. Okay, there is no P wave. And whatever P wave you can see, it's most likely retrograde um, P wave, right? So, sir, <coughs> sir, if, yeah. if, sir, yeah. Uh, yeah. sir if, if we follow the lead to rhythm strip, yes. the apparent P those are being seen is positive. Yes. 
So can it be junctional or because uh, retrograde P should not be positive in lead two. And yes. also the distance from the V wave and retrograde P, if you think about that, it's also different. So it's probably running separately. Yeah. So you're right, because the first of all, POA, the variability can be described. You can have retrograde Wanke bar. But what Tushar made a point is that P wave in lead, V2, in lead two is positive. So probably there is marked sinus bradycardia with junctional escape. Um, yeah. Again, sir, the T wave character is also against the ischemic origin, sir. Yeah. As the T waves are the uh, symmetrical T waves, and the uh, and this is the point against the uh, ischemic origin. Have you say? So, uh, my another rule is, if it is T wave is too ugly, then it is probably not, and the patient is not having any chest pain. It's dizzy. So I said that let's figure out the electrical side. We uh, did the echocardiogram. Echo, EF was before, EF normal now, and we put a permanent pacemaker. Question now, after putting the permanent pacemaker, the dual chamber, this is A paste, and then you see QRS. Does it, does it make, sense to think that this is this was primarily a sinoatrial problem or is it an AV problem? I think Tushar kind of went that path and Rovik Bhai kind of pointed out to that. And that was also our thinking that there was a significant sinus issue also, sinus bradycardia. And then looks like that Ventricular mechanism was probably junctional. Um, and because of the underlying conduction, it appeared white QRS, but it was probably junctional. And then there was, uh, so we put the dual chamber and patient did okay. Any comment? No, I mean, uh, Hafiz, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's probably the, sinus uh, or the issue. And it's very simple. When you uh, put this uh, pacemaker in, you can prove it in the lab. What you do, as soon as you put the atrial lead, just prove the pace AI and you can see the conduction. But keeping in mind, these patients can have both in time, because patient has right bundle uh, and yes. left exit left bundle. Right yeah, left. Yeah, so uh, can have both conduction, intermittent complete, intermittent AV block. Um, so so, so here is the question to you, Rafik Bhai. So normally I enjoy the EP conference because on that day, I just I just drink coffee and enjoy. In other days, I'll have to participate cath and et cetera. So <laughs> the, the third year fellow is asking the EP attending. So in the exam, should I write AV dissociation or we just write sinus node dysfunction? Oh, this this question will never be asked in the exam. Well, in the mechanism, they, they ask you to tick. Yes. So this one, I will, the problem is that you will have to call it sinus nose dysfunction with, with ventricle. With, with AV dissociation, complete heart block because junctional. If it is junctional, then technically, this is complete heart block. Well, no, no, not necessarily true. If you have okay. isorhythmic AV dissociation. But I then mean, it is it... dissociation. Yeah, I... and you, if you say AV dissociation, we are good. Yeah, yes, there is AV dissociation. Question, yeah. as you said, Hafiz, you, you put three points. Does all AV dissociation mean AV block? No. Right, exactly. There can be competing rhythm. I think there are some competing rhythm as Tushar pointed out that the relationship between the P and QRS complex was changing a little bit. And if we had waited long enough on this rhythm stream, you, we would probably find in some place there will be some conducted P wave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So good, good academic discussion, but patient did fine. So um, the patient has cabbage for, uh, and then 
uh, prosthetic valve for um, severe AI, and then post-op uh, went to this rhythm, post-op. This is 58 year old. And next cases will be, we'll go for a rapid fire because we have some questions at the end. I was feeling encouraged because at one point it was 39 or little over 40, but now the audience number has gone down. So we need to patch up. <laughs> Any, anyone? So uh, adenosine was given and then uh, a patient responded and then we did AV nodal reentry tack and then uh, AV nodal abla uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ablation for the AV NRT. And this was the surface EKG after patient did fine. So, and I just wanted to point out that the success rate for AV nodal reentry tack is so good and it is curable. So we need to be very careful about this and probably refer patients for ablation. Um, any comment? No. I mean, even no. uh, if it is standard of treatment and it, uh, the complication that you quoted, I always say one in 200 uh, risk of heart block, which is 0.5%. Um, any center having more than that will have to rethink about ablation. and. Success rate, we quote 95%, we quote recurrence up to 5%, but the recurrence rate I think is way below 1% in, in, in good hand. So this is cure um, and once the ablation is done. So we talked about right bundle, but let's talk about the left bundle and chest pain and then um, uh, presentation like that. So, and we talk about garbosa, just if you have three criteria, the sensitivity may go down, but the specificity will be go up. So in this case, and we, I just put this cartoon because sometimes the residents and fellows have questions about what do you mean by discord and what do you mean by concordance? So this is what we mean by that. And then, uh, and then uh, uh, you, you pay attention to the all three criteria, then, uh, then it becomes more specific. So in our patient, we did the um, cath. It was multi-vessel went for cabbage and did fine. So let me, uh, let me go through another case because I'm, I'm skipping this because I have a fantastic case at the end. Pacemaker indication, you know, uh, Let me go through the last case because okay, so maybe we can take these questions uh, and then we'll finish. 60, um, 60 year old um, with the bradycardia. An electrocardiogram done. This is the EKG. And if you want to read more, cardiac exam negative. And this is the EKG. You can put it on the poll. So let's see. What are the questions? Can you go to the question page? And uh, anyone from the audience other than the faculty to take this one, volunteer? Um, if you are brave enough to answer, 
our sponsor Beximco will give you a gift. Okay. <laughs> so anyone volunteer? Please raise your hand. Right or wrong, you will uh, get the gift. <laughs> Otherwise, even better. <laughs> <laughs> And no actually, one? he should. I feel this answer also will depend on which country you are in, and even in 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 America, which state you are in. But but there's some fundamental principle to that. You know, uh, I think that Dr. Hassan already mentioned that in one of his slides. Yeah. So. One of the things I just want to tell you, the audience that the we need to work clinically, take care of patients, but also we need to pass the board. And the board always wants what is ideal because you are conceptually thinking about the patient and you are answering the correct. So board is not saying you cannot do others, but what is the what is singular number? What is the most appropriate next test? Only problem, Hafiz, is that number D choice will be invalid for Bangladesh. So board expects that we do the treadmill, that then no imaging because ST segment is readable and the goal here is to see that the the conduction system is all right. You don't need to worry about this two to one. It's most likely not infranodal. So that was the oh, Okay, Hafiz, that's the problem. Yeah. Because the patient was not intermittent AV block, right? It was two to one heart block. I know what board wants. The problem with board is three, four years behind, but does it really <laughs> make sense? to do a treadmill on a person who is two to one at a resting ECG. Yeah, but to defend the board, board gave a clue because it is Nana. a otherwise asymptomatic patient. He's an avid marathon runner who yeah. exercises regularly without limitation. So this is the trick that board actually giving some clue that don't mess around. Yes, so next one, but if this patient is in Maryland, we are going to do a Lyme test because we have high yeah. incidence of Lyme disease. Yes. yes. So that is a problem. And I mean, to, be, to defend the board, Rafik Bhai, if you are doing Lyme test, it is appropriate. But what is the most appropriate next test? So, um, and I think, and, I think the and, most important thing that uh, I'd like to comment on that, uh, what's the easiest, quickest way we can answer that? Uh, as for example, like if I, I'd like to, for our audience, I'd like to give some understanding of that. Here, the they want you to differentiate whether it's in the AV node or below the AV node problem, okay? If you exercise uh, or you do any sympathetic activity that can increase your sympathetic drive, and if your AV node is good, then it's going to increase the heart rate. If you're below the node problem, then you're bombarding from top faster heart rate. Then, yeah. then below the node is already disease. Then you'll have interruption of conduction. Then you'll see it might prolong or, or drop a beat. So that's the fundamental principle they wanted to differentiate with quick test. I, I believe that's, that's the idea of that question. But Wadud, interestingly, if you, uh, I can tell you, if you go to the, any board review courses, in every session, you know, primary MR, secondary MR, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, lot of discussion, and the faculty discuss with the, with the audience. In the EKG part, like this, the faculty, like Mike Beagle, you know, and when Shabati Dramatullah was alive, they say, in this session, there'll be no discussion because no discussion. They will give you the question, answer, move to the next one. So they, they say it is non-negotiable. It does not matter what you think. It matters what the board thinks. 
<laughs> so, so, and the majority uh, will will dictate. So uh, that's why it is very tricky. And uh, and Rovik Bhai and Aziz Bhai knows if he, if anybody does not pass the EKG part, the whole board uh, scoring is invalid because you fail the EKG part, you fail the whole thing. It is so important for the fellows um, to to go the EKG right. So maybe do you have time for one or two questions or we go to the Yes, please. Okay, so 60 year old with paroxysmal AFib. And uh, let me she was started on sodalol and then she was brought for ambulance for emergency department with dizziness, blood pressure 120, 70, potassium 3.2. And this, this EKG. Hafiz, please go back. <laughs> I, I wish they had not put the potassium level in this question. <laughs> yes, it's to confuse you a little bit more. No, I mean, it should be a simple thing that somebody on Sotalol gets diuretics. What mm -hmm. can happen? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what is the... Which of the following should uh, be, but I was okay, Rafik Bhai, to give the potassium level, but I did not like the options of answer. They said IV, potassium, and magnesium. So they should have changed the uh, mm -hmm. yeah. options a little different. But in any case, this was uh, anyone volunteer to take this? What is it? I think it's from the audience or for the faculty? <laughs> no, 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 for the audience, of course. Uh, faculty. From somebody answered uh, IB potassium and magnesium. Okay, but can you can you tell me the what is the diagnosis? I think whoever answered the IB potassium and magnesium probably was thinking of. And I, I, I yeah, he said Tarsad. Okay, perfect. I you think part advice. of the problem is that <laughs> our interaction with the audience is that their microphone is not open, so they cannot talk. So Hafiz, can you go back? Yeah. So you have uh, you have reservation about the choice of IB potassium and magnesium? No, no, no. I'm saying it is too obvious. It made it yes. so easy. Yes, because... but, but but why magnesium? That is my question. Oh, oh yeah. That's actually a very good question. Why and magnesium? It's interesting because if you look at, we have been using magnesium for a long time in preeclampsia and eclampsia. So the primary problem is hypokalemia, but the magnesium will stabilize the membrane quickly. Yes. So that even if the magnesium level is low, while the potassium, because potassium will take time to replenish. And during that time, magnesium will help. We don't need a temporary transvenous pacemaker because the heart rate is already up. Electric cardioversion is not a choice because there is no sustained arrhythmia. IV amiodarone on the top of sotalol will make the situation worse. Same will be the case of IV metoprolol. It will make the bradycardia worse and make more tarsal. fat. Very interesting, good case. And this is a very relevant case because in Bangladesh, we have sotalol. We use a lot of sotalol in this country. And a lot of these patients have hypertension and we have a tendency to put them on diuretics. So please watch out. A any patient on Sotalol or any QT prolonging drug, we have to be careful before we put them on diuretics without potassium supplement. And also so, important to mention one thing, is bradycardia dependent arrhythmia with QT prolongation. So uh, also if the heart rate goes too slow, that can cause this QT prolongation more this, this type of medication. And particularly it was increased dose recently from 80 to 120 twice a day. Thanks, Hafiz. Uh, actually, Hafiz, I want you to ask, Hafiz, I want so you to ask one, me, Hafiz. Do you want to do, so the reason I said this, Rafik, by that it is better that um, if they did not give the potassium and then gave a choice, like IV magnesium, the next step. Um, but this is the last one. Can uh, you can read this? Hello. No. no, 
what is there happening here? Okay, I'll call back. And it needs to go back to the hospital ER. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, um, so AFib and then peel in the pocket uh, for AFib uh, given by flaconide. So for the for the sake of time, what property of flaconide makes it particularly effective in the setting like peel in the pocket? Why we use flaconide for peel in the pocket? Is it the mechanism? Is it that the flaconide shortens the action potential, shortens the refractory period? or use dependence or increase rate of membrane depolarization or increase in delayed after depolarization. It is not unfair because this is SEC staff, like a general cardiology. So that's why I thought this is not a bad question. It, it will be harder, more harder, more in the EP board, but if it is in the SEC general cardiology then uh, it is okay to discuss. Any comment? This is a, going to be a superstar. If anybody from the audience can get this question right, I will personally salute you. And, and an award as uh, Atarvai. <laughs> Pointed out. Atharva actually said, true, true, true. even if you write wrong, it's still good. You can make it open for everybody. Okay. Afiz, yeah. I think we should bring this question at a different time, but. Okay, sure. We can start. No, no, no. But, but interesting. I'll just give you audience. I think we need to bring this question. This is a very interesting. And that will, we can combine this with the effect of the drugs. Yeah. Flaconide is a sodium, is a, is a, a channel blocker. And so um, I think we should, we should bring it with, um, with other. Um, yeah, maybe when you do your basic one, action potential and channel blockers, yes. maybe we can bring this. Okay, yeah. This will be a very I good agree. question for that. Thank you. I'll stop here. Thank you, Chaudhary Abhijasan, sir, for excellent case selection, demonstration, and, exp and explaining the scenario. We are very much delighted to have you among us. Before the uh, end of the session, I'd like to request Professor M. Athali, sir, to uh, share his views on this lecture session. Athali, sir. Really, we enjoyed today real life beautiful cases. Practical, practical cases. Actually, these are the cases I also uh, face every day, almost every day. So real life, beautiful cases, nicely presented and excellently it is uh, discussed. Congratulations and thank you, Habiz Bhai, for your excellent selection and uh, presenting the cases. So, uh, so, sir, we can conclude the session, but before that, we have a next session in March 12th. And in that day, our presenter will be our Rupi Ghamed, sir. And I have a request to the attendees. Those of us, those who came today, I really thank you. But could you do us a big favor? Each of you can bring two of your two of your uh, colleagues, at least two. So we have a above sixty number. You know, it is important, and you, it's important to good to see each other, but also learn because uh, you know if twenty of us can bring. 40 others, it will be 60. We really need to get our audience number up. And I think I will request Beximco to also encourage uh, physicians. One of the best way to disseminate knowledge is to ensure more attendance. Um, uh, so before leaving the session, there's a question in the chat box. A very important issue has been uh, taken up by Dr. Kamal Parvez, he, his question is, a 13-year-old child presented with VT due to myocarditis, she was hemodynamically unstable with low GCS, 
though the GCS marking was 15 by 15, he mentioned, might be a, a little less. And the patient has one guardian, elder brother of 17-year-old boy, who refused to give consent for electrical cardioversion. So what a doctor should do ethically? A very real life uh, scenario he has mentioned. So I first, uh, I'd like to request Professor Rafi Khamed sir to give his view what he can do in US. And then I'd request uh, Wadu Chaudhary sir to give mm -hmm. our perspective. Rafi Khamed sir. Well, I mean, if somebody's in the ER, hemodynamically unstable, I think Hafiz will agree that if two physicians think that this patient's life can be saved by this fairly non-invasive procedure, you can proceed with cardioversion um, because this is not an invasive procedure. And the problem is that somebody going into VF, I don't have time to go out and ask, find the family and ask for permission to do cardioversion. It will be just like doing CPR in the, in the street. Hafiz? And to, to support Rafiq, I tell you, the final authority is by the patient. If the patient cannot say anything, then it is legally the power of attorney. The power of attorney, if the hospital does not know who the power of attorney, then the physicians can override any other wish of the family, which is not a good idea, but legally. In this case, even more, because the guardian is 17 year old, who is also a minor. So in the case of minor related, you know, minor and then treatment issues, then it, it falls really on the physician. So that, but in Bangladesh, that may not apply because you'll have to pay attention to the, not only the 17 year old, also the distant relatives who will be heavy handed. But let me have a comment. 13 year old with VT, and then you unstable, you, you cardiovert for sure. But the underlying issue may be a giant cell myocarditis, mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. if there is inflammation. So you really need to think about how you treat the giant cell myocarditis. I'm suspecting that this is giant cell myocarditis. Or, or if, if it is, I mean, I can't say anything more because it's the clinical setting like fever and then recent acute onset. But if you do an echo and you see that the RV is humongous or LV is humongously dilated, then it is not an acute problem. It is a chronic problem. But or if you have, have a congenital heart congenital heart never been diagnosed before and you are just seeing the VT. See, so it okay. is a wide differential, but not only the VT, also start thinking about what is the underlying issue. And so I have one question just to- Just one our... second. I just want to make, half, uh, I would like to interrupt you for a second. The other part is, who is asking the family? Yes, that, that's it's my question. They should not even important. ask it. Yes, it is very important. Mm -hmm. In this kind of critical situation, we will always send the senior most person in the command to go and talk to the patient. And how am I talking to the patient? I'm going to, with utmost respect and dignity to the family, showing compassion that I mean the best interest of their patient. I cannot send an orderly, hey, by the way, that is not going to work. And I think it is very, very unlikely that, uh, that when we approach patients, whether we to give treatment or to withhold treatment in both cases, we have, we always succeed when we show compassion. Ajit. Yes, I think the main concern is that uh, if it is hemodynamically unstable, you really don't have to ask permission. And, and, and you really need to make sure, and you can, you know, safely ask if somebody in the room, I'm not sure what's the situation in Bangladesh, we can ask the family member to go outside when you're treating the patient. Because if it's selective cases, you can ask for permission, okay? But in unstable cases, this type of scenario, if you spend time talking with the family on the phone, by the time patient will die, you really have to act quickly. I would, I would like to hear uh, Wadud and otherwise comment because yes, you are there in the field. Uh -huh. Sir, uh, due to time constraint, I request Atharali sir to give the uh, comment in this regard and to uh, uh, summary the presentation, today's presentation, because we are already around 11 a.m. Uh, Atharali sir. 
Sir, this is really, uh, this is a routine practice. Actually, we don't seek permission for every cases yes. for mm -hmm. the cardioversion, sir. We see in the uh, CCU or in the emergency room, we give the decision when it is needed. And uh, I think the Robic sir rightly said, when the two physicians agree that this, this is useful for the patient, we do it. Sir, it is not our routine practice to ask the patient and to seek the permission mm -hmm. for giving the DC cardioversion. Okay. Thank you, sir. So uh, this is, a, a we are towards the end. And I am, uh, thank you all the participants for being with us for quite a long time. And our next presentation will be on the 12th March, presented by none other than Professor Robert Amit, sir. So we'd like to, uh, request our participants to present on that, uh, that session. And as Dr. Chaudhary Hafiz has requested, we'll try to bring more and more physicians who will get benefit from these presentations. Thank you very much, all the physicians. Thank you, our panelists. Thank you. The speaker. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And Thank you. last but not the least, Vaccine Pro Pharmaceuticals for their continuing support in this program. Thank you.